Hello. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Angel Alonso. I'm the Vice Dean of the School of Global and Public Affairs at I University in Madrid, and I have the great pleasure of moderating today's panel. Uh, this is a session on ice sitting and digital democracy, so in case everyone uh, is fully aware of where we are. And uh, I'm trying, we're trying to get some information about the exact time that we have. Uh, we are not sure, as you know, we're running with a bit of a delay uh, because the sessions in the morning took a bit longer than expected. We don't know whether we will have to finish at 3 or 3.15. Hopefully it will be the letter, so we have a little bit more time with our speakers. Um, but um, I, will, I will let you know, uh, one of our speakers has to excuse herself at 3 o'clock, so we know that for sure. Um, the session, of course, is, uh, is uh, tackling one of the issues that is defined as one of the main pillars of this, of this ministerial, but of course it's very transversal in nature. Uh, practically speaking, uh, the digital dimension uh, uh, crosses all the, all the challenges and all the opportunities that we were uh, mentioning today, this morning, uh, for democracy, ranging from transparency to participation to misinformation. And of course, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a common known theme that uh, uh, technology, it's a double, double sword or double edge component into this discussion. No? It can be on the one hand a multiplier, an accelerator of all the good things that we associate to democracy, engaging people, making uh, democratic uh, process more inclusive. But of course, uh, together with, uh, with technology we, and, and with uh, digitalization, we have seen an acceleration of some of the negative sides uh, that we are discussing in this, in this forum and this ministerial. Uh, the benefit of today's session is that we're going to have the opportunity to cover all these topics with a very distinguished panel of speakers from, from different angles, uh, representing both governments but also different institutions uh, with an overall uh, outlook into the questions that, that we are addressing. Let me just introduce very briefly uh, our panelists. Uh, we have Alexandra van Hoevelen who is the Minister of Digitalization of the Netherlands, uh, and Alexandra has to leave us at three, so uh, we'll try also to be very effective in the way that we run the session. Uh, we have Kevin Casas, who is the Secretary General of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistance, IDEA, based in Stockholm. We have Juan Jesus Torres Carbonell, uh, General Secretary of Digital Administration in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Digital Transformation in, in Spain. Next to me, we have Peter. Peter Walcott is the head of the Australian Public Service Commission. We also have Minister Milva Economy, Minister of State for Service Standards in Albania. And finally, online, we have uh, my good friend and colleague from many years in the OECD, Andy Wyckoff, uh, who heads the Directorate of Science, Technology and Innovation. So the other dimension, uh, but the more technical uh, dimension of the topic that, we are, that we're covering today. Um, in the session, what we're going to do is I'm going to pose a question, uh, trying to cover different angles of, uh, of the topic at, at play to each of the speakers. And also because this morning there was not an opportunity to properly exchange with the audience, uh, after the first round, and rather than focusing on a second round, yeah. and given that we have very limited time, I think it's more productive if I offer the opportunity for the speakers to react on uh, the things that uh, the other speakers have said. And then, of course, we turn it to you, because uh, this is, of course, about democracy, and this is about participation, so nothing better than, than sharing the floor with, uh, with all of you. So let me just go straight into, into the, the panel and the questions. And let me start with Kevin, uh, because, uh, of course, Kevin is uh, bringing an overall perspective from international idea, which is, as you all know, a very key actor in the democratic space, and they uh, regularly publish the Global State of Democracy report. No? The latest edition was in 2021, there's another one coming and there's up. another one coming soon. So maybe if Kevin wants to share any insights, that would be very, very welcome. But of course, in the previous report, and hopefully in the next one, they already cover in, uh, in depth some of the issues no? that, uh, that we associate with the challenges and opportunities that uh, digitalization poses for, for democracy ranging from digital voting, digital participation, but also challenges like surveillance or digital violence. So along these lines, Kevin, uh, maybe you could share with us your view on the current positive and negative impacts of digital transformation on democracy 
and these latest trends that you are following from, from your institution. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Angel, and, and I want to express my gratitude to the OECD, of course. It's, uh, it's important for IDEA and, and for the global cause of democracy that the OECD actively gets into the discussion as to how to advance and protect democracy in the face of severe headwinds. Uh, look, to your question, I mean, the positive aspects are, are many. Uh, and, and I will mention a few uh, in, in a very quick way. You know, I will sound like one of those guys that, that speaks in the background of, you know, medication commercials, right? Uh, uh, look, number one, digital technologies lower the cost for collective action for organizing around causes, demands, grievances, rights. And this is particularly important for vulnerable groups. Number two, digital technologies, and in particular social media, have also created new forms of engaging with public issues in the digital arena. And this is crucial for young people who appear to be very reluctant to use the traditional vehicles of political participation, and yet, are, in many cases, very active around causes. Number three, digital technologies have created a new agora in which the communication of opinion is multi-directional. Uh, you know, they have done away with that more hierarchical, one-directional communication from the elites down to the masses. Number four, they also enable faster circulation of information, which is something that has proven crucial for the purposes of denouncing corruption and organizing people to demand accountability. Number five, they enable better and more efficient tools to manage electoral processes. And I'm not talking necessarily about e-voting, but about things like the fast transmi transmission and tallying of electoral results, for example. Number six, they have had a positive impact on political finance. They can lower campaign costs and they have democratized fundraising. The ability to raise large amounts of funds in small donations through the internet is, is well established by now. And last but not least, they can help immensely with the efficient delivery of public services, which is of course vital for democratic legitimacy. Now, there are many serious negatives, too. Number one, they enable the fast spread of disinformation and misinformation, which is clearly fueling runaway polarization levels in many places. Number two, they fragment public discussions. You know, the notion that we all share more or less the same facts and partake in a common conversation has been shattered by the internet and even more by the social media. Number three, they offer great opportunities, as you mentioned, Angel, for surveillance and control, which is something that has not been lost on authoritarian regimes. Number four, they create opportunities to subvert electoral processes, not only through disinformation campaigns, but also through plain cyber attacks. And number five, and this is the flip side of the positive effect on political finance, they can also make fundraising and electoral spending far less transparent. Uh, regulating political advertising and spending on social media has proved enormously challenging, and you also have the role of cryptocurrencies to fund campaigns. So all in all, this is a very complicated equation. And my impression is that we've gone from a cheerful view of the impact of digital technologies on democracy at the time of the Arab Spring to a dark and ominous view after Brexit and the 2016 US election. And we probably swung too far in the negative direction. The, the positive impacts of digital technologies on democracy are considerable. So regulation efforts of the digital sphere for the sake of protecting democracy should be careful of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, because the baby has many wonderful features. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Kevin. I was just informed that luckily we can, we can keep the session until 3.15, so we have a little bit more time to exchange about this, uh, this issue. Thank you for a tour de force. I think I could, no one could have sort of do a listing better than you about all these pros and cons, and hopefully we will go back to them uh, later on, because even many of them, if you look at them, they, it's the same issue that it can have a positive reading depending on the use or a negative reading depending of, of that. Um, let me maybe focus uh, with uh, Minister Van Hoevelen on the issue of rules and oversight. And allow me to cite the minister um, who uh, said, uh, I, I open quote, democracy, security, and fundamental rights lie at the heart of our society. We must provide for clear rules and oversight when these values are under threat. So minister, what rules and oversights are needed Sorry, <laughs> what rules and oversights are needed to manage digital transformation impacts? Yeah, thank, yeah. thank you very much for your... Oh, it's uh, out now. Yeah, now it's working, right? Um, yes, um, as governments, I believe we do need to take the responsibility and to respond to the previous uh, speaker, I have a bit gloomier picture or, of um, uh, where we stand and what needs to be done. Um, I believe governments need to take the responsibility to play a strong role in shaping the digital transition to, to make it in a way that we believe it should be done. And this would be, of course, in line with our values. Fundamental rights and values like privacy, transparency, non-discrimination, all that are, I think, at stake in the digital transition that we're seeing today. And that really makes, makes it possible, or not possible, but necessary uh, to have very solid rules of the game, oversight and strategic autonomy as well. And this is also why in the Netherlands we created a value-driven digitalization agenda, which is of course very much also based on the work that is done in the EU. And this agenda is just based on four principles. The first would be that everybody can participate in the digital world. Um, in our country, about 20% of the population is unable to really use digital tools or use them in a way that they can interact with government or the private sector. And I do believe we need to change that. And this is not only uh, elderly people, this is also people who just finished working or have, are in their, somewhere in the midst of their career. It is also children, younger people, that are able to use their smartphone, but not use it in a way to, for instance, interact with government. And not in the least. It's also people that are of my generation, not raised with digital tools and digital skills and in a digital world, and have to rule a digital transformation that we are probably not very much aware of, of have not enough knowledge of. So this is one thing. Participate in the digital area, make sure that everybody is able to participate, and also, of course also create governmental services that are going to work for everyone, and services that are not only going to be digital, but also um, very, um, very much also in terms of face-to-face -face contact. Secondly, what I find important is that everybody can trust the digital world. And this means, I'm not going to expand on it uh, very, very deeply, of course we need to work very, very diligently on cybersecurity. And we need to regulate, for instance, AI. Make sure it's transparent and that it's based on our fundamental rights, which it is not today. And I'm very happy that not only the EU, but also the Council of Europe, a far broader um, group of countries, is working on a treaty in order to regulate, um, uh, regulate AI in a way that is going to um, you know, look at these fundamental rights and transparency and, and so on and so forth. Third point would be that everybody has to have control over their digital life. So each citizen must know what kind of information is being um, uh, retrieved, what kind of information is being uh, required in certain transactions, how data are going to be used, how they're going to be used in a private sector, but also in a public sector. And also they have to be self-determined in how they are going to do it. And yes, I'm aware that there is a cookie law, but we all know that everybody's clicking on yes and then sending out all of your data to almost everybody in the world. Uh, using it for whatever purposes that organization of countries seems to think is right. So one of the things that we're going to create is a public wallet 
that is going to contain all of your identity um, stuff and makes it uh, possible for you to share your data, of course, on the basis of, of your whatever you want yourself, um, and also on the basis of all the laws and, and regulation that we believe should be in place, all the values that should be in place. Um, and that means also that you're, you're only sharing the data that you want to share with the organizations that you want to share it with. And then, just to conclude, we believe that the government, the digital government, needs to work in a value-driven and open manner. We need to set the example in terms of transparency, in terms of human rights, in terms of non-discrimination. And, um, and that is something that I believe we need to do all together. And this, of course, can only be achieved if we do it as countries together. There's no way that each country for itself can decide to work on all these things. But I believe these principles, so if everybody can join in, can trust, control, and a government that is going to work very hard it's going to be super necessary to make sure that this digital world is a world that looks like the world we want it to look like. And then, of course, it's going to lead to trust and uh, a support of democracy and the de democratic institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Um, this actually paves the way very nicely to, uh, to, to turn to our uh, guest online, to Andy Wyckoff. Uh, precisely because you advocated for regulation no, and the role of governments. And of course, uh, we have uh, here representatives from four governments. But Andy, uh, in a month from now, uh, you are hosting another very important ministerial for the OECD, the Ministerial for the Digital Economy, in which, of course, I was mentioning how transversal the, uh, the issue of digitalization is for a, um, a ministerial on democracy. But also for you, the issue of democratic implications and the governance of implications are, of course, critical for a ministerial that is focused on the other dimension, no? which is the digital one. And of course, this is a topic that the OECD has been covered for over 20 years. No? You had the first ministerial in Ottawa in 1998. Uh, then we had Cancun. We had Seoul. And, uh, and of course, we are in a different moment. No? Many things have happened. It would be very interesting to, to hear what you think are the two or three key policy priorities no, that governments should be considering from your side, no, from your dimension when you look at these topics? So, Angel, thank, thank you very much. And uh, you are a good student of the OECD. I can see that. And you're, you're right. This, this committee uh, doesn't hold ministerials very often. But when they do, they're, I think, at real pivotal points. And I think we're at another one of those points, and I think the discussions today in Luxembourg uh, bear that out as, as, as well. Let, let me quickly talk about what I think are some of the connecting threads between the two ministerials, and I appreciate the opportunity to kind of make this, this, this handshake. That, and a lot of it has already been, been, been said. I think one of the most fundamental things right now online, and it's a fundamental human right, is that the right to be safe? Um, and there's various dimensions of, of, of this, um, but without that one fundamental right, not much else really matters uh, in, in some context. Um, it's about the right to be safe from uh, content, whether it's illegal, and we see a fair amount of that, what we call terrorist, violent, and extreme content, gender-based violence, child sexual exploitive, material and abusive material or, or just harmful content like what you're talking about today about mis and disinformation cyberbullying trolling you 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 name it and why this stuff has always been around it comes now at a scale and a, a speed which is uh, magnified by digital tools um, and it's not only about uh, digital and virtual things it's about physical safety and I think the minister just spoke about cybersecurity. That will be another focus of, of the uh, ministerial. Uh, it's about protecting the infrastructure, including critical infrastructure, but it's also about protecting people, um, their mental health uh, and their well, well-being. Um, I, I, a second point, which is the more general point, is about bringing rights more in line with the digital age. Um, that will be a focus of the CDEP Committee on Digital Economy Policy Ministerial as, as well. 
uh, internet and social media have revolutionized the way we express freedom of expression. Kevin was just talking about, about this. Um, and we may need to do a rethink of how to balance the priorities between freedom of expression and other online harms in this new era. I, I want to call out, I think uh, Juan Jesus will talk about this in a second, Spain, which will be our host, but also has been at the forefront of advancing uh, what Spain's Charter on Digital Rights, which will be adopted uh, last year. That will be the focus of the high-level opening session of the ministerial, as well as a dedicated ministerial workshop. And more broadly, we want to explore kind of emerging approaches in various countries across the OECD, beyond Europe, uh, on how to protect and enforce rights may need to uh, e evolve. Let me just end. While policies and principles such as our AI principles are important, I think we need to think about an institutional response as, as well. And here, one of the things I would uh, ask you to think about, which I think is a priority, is kind of rethinking the governance of technology more, more broadly. Um, uh, I think we need to move to a more proactive stance rather than reactive. Um, your sister committee uh, in uh, on regulatory policy has promulgated a regulation on in this area on agile regulatory governance to harness innovation, which I think is a really good first step. But I just want to say predicting and shaping how a technology may evolve without negatively affecting innovations that society may need. We've just seen this through the COVID pandemic is far from simple. Efforts to do this, I think, require a deep technological understanding and an ability to kind of scan where technology is and what the new developments might be. Um, I think we need to do this internationally, given the globally inherent nature of digital te technologies. But amongst partners that kind of share a view of technology that's centered around promoting human rights and democratic values in a way that benefits society as, as, as a whole. And at the CDEP ministerial will have dedicated sessions on artificial intelligence, which is an area we've been working on for five years now, and immersive technologies. Let me, uh, again, thanks for, for, for the opportunity, and I look forward to the dialogue uh, going forward in the panel. Thank you, Andy, and that's a very ambitious agenda and very comprehensive, the one you, you have. Uh, maybe in the discussion, I think we could go back to one of the key elements that you mentioned, which is the governance, no? and how we go about that governance of, of technology in an international scale. No? Uh, since you mentioned the Spain, who is the host of the, of the ministerial, in, which is taking place in the Canary Islands in, in a month, let me just turn to uh, Juan, uh, Juan Jesus Torres, uh, especially to uh, develop in, 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 the, in the aspect that you mentioned, no? where Spain has been very pioneering, no? which is the Charter of Digital Rights. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, uh, Juan Jesus, um, how is the Charter and other initiatives that you might be uh, uh, pr promoting from uh, the Secretary of State of, of the Digital Agenda uh, helping Spain no? refit democracy for the digital age? Thank you so much for, um, uh, for having me here in, in this conference and, uh, and for the question. And regarding the Charter of Digital Rights, um, uh, I would like to, to mention that the, uh, the, uh, the democracy for uh, the digital age uh, uh, is to guarantee that the rights and uh, freedoms that citizens enjoy in the offline world uh, should be equally uh, protected in the online world. So the intense progress uh, of scientific research and uh, digital or digital-based technologies uh, um, put on the table the necessity of a regulatory framework that guarantees the protection of the individual and collective rights of person and the constitutional values. The Charter of uh, Digital Rights, uh, rights uh, doesn't seek to create new fundamental rights, but to adapt these rights and provide a cutting edge framework for interpretation 
in order to face and manage the new conflicts. Um, the objective is to provide um, current legislation onto the, the technological reality, as well as uh, the public uh, authorities, to define public standards and policies to guarantee and promote these rights. So uh, uh, the Charter of Digital Rights doesn't seek to create new fundamental rights. It is a dynamic process given that uh, the digital environment is in constant uh, evolution. And so in consequence, uh, the limits and uh, the needs of the citizens are changing uh, continuously. So we are working to ensure the existence of an open and permanent process to improve the adaptation of the digital framework to the new circumstances. The charter was presented by the president of the government in July 2021, and is made up of several chapters, including digital rights in specific environments. And I would like to remark uh, the following one, the data uh, protection, cyber security, no discrimination in the digital environment, protection of minors, freedom of expression, freedom of information, receive accurate information, public participation by digital means, rights of access to data for public record, health protections, and the guarantee of rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Jesus. Um, sorry. So one aspect that uh, somehow uh, underlies the whole debate about uh, democracy and digitalization is the one of data, no? the use of data and, uh, uh, and, and, and the leverage of data no? to, to advance democracy, but also the challenges related to the usage of, of data no? in a democracy. Um, I want to turn now to uh, Minister Milva Economy because uh, she has a wide experience having worked in the public sector on data and statistics. And even in the panel this morning, in the, in the first panel, uh, the, the head of the statistics uh, in Luxembourg uh, recalled no, the importance of, of having good statistics no, about, about this dimension. Uh, data as information, of course, is a key element of democratic regimes, and it can be used for uh, governments to keep governments and political actors accountable. Uh, Minister, from your perspective, uh, what data is needed to improve democracy and especially, and maybe this is the most interesting aspect, what actors should be brought in to advance uh, the digital democratic agenda in this front? Thank you very much. Thank you for making me part of this uh, panel. I would like to start with something that uh, I do believe that digitalization is not reversible anymore. So we have to cope with that, with the very good things that they have brought, but also the problem that they have caused. Saying that, I would like to add the role that digitalization has had in the democracy. The first thing is that we have to take care about our people, our businesses, and how much easy we are making their life. So we are providing services. In Albania, we have uh, the system of e-services now that provide 1,226 services online. 95% of services is online. And there are 2.7 million inhabitants that are using those services out of 2.8 inhabitants that country has. And uh, in six first months of this year, the system has uh, uh, made application around uh, three, uh, three, uh, 30 million uh, application. So the services are there and they are easily to be accessed for anyone, wherever they are living, in the rural area, in the urban area, if they are young or they are old, they can have access to that information. They can have access to their computer, they can have access to their mobile. So you can make application wherever you are. The second is that, uh, are we making our agencies more accountable? Are we doing accountability as a figure that is important and transmitting this to the public? And the case of Albania is bringing us the examples that uh, to give answer to the population, we are combining data in 55 registers. And by the end of application or by the end of a request, the public serv servant 
I used to give a letter that has a digital, a digital signature at the end. So this makes the public service accountable towards the population. And here you have data, 55 register are doing a lot of uh, application during the month, and this data is there, published. The, second, the third thing that I consider that is very important is uh, do we allow people to say, to have their voice in what we are doing? Are we digitalizing this participation of people in our uh, govern governance? And in Albania, we have the uh, public participation online through the roster of civil society or through the website of the ministries. And each month we are uh, calculating an indicator that is called the index of uh, feasibility of public consultation. And this is going up and down because not every time everything is going well. Uh, perhaps we have put things in, the, uh, in delay in the website, or perhaps people have not have any kind of uh, desire to answer. And this is something to go uh, deeper in analysis, but this is a situation. And then we have used digitalization to, uh, to combat corruption, which is not a very easy thing. And we have done this through e services, but also we have measured things. For example, one of the things that we have done through the digitalization of services is uh, how much of the contract uh, are, of the public funds are being used without uh, going in, in call for tenders. And if in the year 2018 we have had around 10% of the budget going to, uh, to be contracting without, uh, without uh, tenders, now this percentage is 3.4. So even this has been declined. And the other thing that is very important is that how we see the international laws influencing in this anti-corruption. In Albania, for example, we have the case of the register of the, uh, of the final beneficiary. And the register of the final beneficiary has been, not that it has been easy to, to create the law. It has been not so easy to implement the law and to create the register. We've had a lot of uh, pre and cons with businesses, but the problem is that you have to communicate that. And through the public communication that is online, everything was there, registered. And so this helped the process. I think that one of the most important things in this data creation and this system communication is if we have in place regulation from the front office and back office. Are those regulations very clear to the public uh, servants? Do they know how to use those? And more the satisfactory rate is high, more we think that this is good. But are we uh, in the government taking care about how we have to re-engineer the situation where people and businesses are not happy. How, what we are going to do with the data? The second thing that is also important there is the cyber attack. We in Albania have been under cyber attack. From, it, it was very hard, very strong. The system went down for more than uh, 15 days. But this creates us another instrument in the, in the head that you cannot afford cyber attack alone. You have to, sh to have experience from other countries. You have to share experience. And also you have to plan in the budget inf uh, money for inf infrastructure, digital infrastructure. So more you advance, also the, uh, the, the grim world, the dark world is advancing. And they are, they are there to attack you. But you have to be prepared. And this creates another situation that public administration need to be always, always under training for resilience because these are resilient situations, and they have to know how to cope with the situation. Um, but doing that, I think that is very important how we are going to use the data, what kind of data we are going to produce, because having digitalized everything, you have enormous amount of data. Which are the data? And for that, I think that uh, a good instrument that can be, can be used is the, the creation of um, multi-committees with multi-stakeholders. In Albania, we have created one for the Open Government Partnership, where civil society is sitting there, and they have to make requests and define their needs to be part of the open data in order that they can access. This is a situation that always needs to be fit, fit with a request from the civil society, but also fit with the improvement that uh, 
gover government and governmental agencies are doing in their everyday life, but the data are there. So we can have data that are related with participation, related with how fast we are providing the services, how um, much we have heard uh, a given voice from coming from uh, stakeholder groups, and data are there, we can use the data. But it depends also on uh, how, as we have heard today, how much independent are the agencies that are dealing with the data. And in the case of Albania, a statistical office now is very independent, is a parliamentary institution, so no link with the government at all. And they have to, and they have to be accountable to all stakeholders in the country. But also for them, it's important that different stakeholders create, um, or, or create offers to, to produce the, the reports that are needed. So that's all. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, and also for sharing the specific experiences. Let me pick it up on the third, what was the third element that you mentioned, uh, and I love how you put it, voice, no? which is participation. And then I'll, I'll turn to Peter, no? because of course, as head of the Australian Public Service, sorry, head of the Australian Public Service Commission, with over 150,000 public servants. He's, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I, I keep losing the, the sound there. Uh, the issue of uh, participation, of course, is, is critical. So Peter, in your experience, how should governments work from their insight to foster citizen participation and increase their uh, responsiveness to reinforce uh, uh, democracy? Uh, um, thank you, and, and can also thank the OECD for hosting this, um, this ministerial conference. I mean, it's an extraordinarily prof profound subject and uh, one that uh, requires a lot of thought. Um, public sector reform is, an, as we all know, it's a sort of never-ending journey for all of us. We're all grappling essentially with, with the, same, the same challenges. Um, the, uh, sort of the, uh, it's partly driven, of course, by the, the speed of technological change and just how quick that, quickly that is moving and how governments can, can keep up with that and also citizens' expectations around how government manages, manages that, 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 those changes. And um, I've got to say, um, the digital world and social media is essentially changing the nature of power in democracies. It's very different for authoritarian states where it's a, quite, a different, quite a different thing you're looking at. But in democracies, the power that's moving to collective groups just adds to the complexity of how, of how democracy works. And the ability to mobilise quickly, the ability to get reactions very quickly is part of what we have to deal with as governments in our societies. Now, I'll try and get a bit practical, but the Australian focus on reform, uh, and we've had a, three years ago, we had a major uh, review done on, on the Australian public sector and what it needed to do. And essentially it was four buckets. One was you've got to be much more joined up. You've, um, issues are so complex and interconnected that the old pillars, the old structures of which we did things just doesn't work anymore. So, and COVID was an example of that, where, you know, in Australia, you had our health department having to work for the first time with our Department of Home Affairs quite intimately. And it really does change the, the nature of structures in government. So that's one of the issues we're, we're, we're grappling with. And of course, a big part of that is, is data and digital, um, being able to integrate data and, 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 and digital work at scale. Uh, and COVID, again, was, a, a, for us, a, a real accelerator of, of, of that. The second aspect we're looking at is being much more people-focused in, in what we do as public servants. Again, the expectations that we should operate like a bank or like Facebook, and very, very hard um, for us to meet and, 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 and keep up with. But also, it's, it's actually fundamental to trust, because um, people get their experience of government and their trust and faith in government from their dealings with government, in whether it's in relation to services, and also critically a part of that, of course, is, is, is being able to protect the information and the issue of cyber, cyber threats, and of course, the speed at which things move. Then the third aspect of our reform agenda is around integrity in everything we do, which comes back to the whole concept of trust. And then the fourth one is a concept we call partnerships. So the public sector has to be seen as working in partnership with, uh, we will have a federal system, so with our state and territory governments, has to work in partnership with civil society. 
has to work in partnership with uh, First Nations. And that's a quite an interesting aspect in, in terms of Australia too, because um, the, um, the issue there is that what does genuine partnership mean with First Nations? They work and think in a different way than the bureaucracies work and think. And so we have to rethink the whole way we and a whole understanding of what, what partnership is. So it's a whole complex um, series of sort of, um, of mixes there. And one of the things that we've tried to do, again, in a practical sense, is we have a, a Australian Public Service Academy, and we try to teach public sector craft, uh, is what we call it. And again, part of that is how you do engagement, how you do engagement with First Nations people, how you do engagement with civil society or business or trade unions. And again, there's a bit of risk in that because ministers can sometimes get a bit un uncomfortable with, with that sort of engagement. But I think it's absolutely crucial to how we work with, with civil society and, and with the public. It's no longer can you do things to people. I think you've got to more and more do things with people. And so it's co-design, it's transparency, it's those sorts of techniques and, and uh, that are going to be fundamental to the um, to way we work into the future. Thank you very much, Peter, and for bringing into the discussion very interesting elements that the issue of expectations and, 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 and the element of partnerships no? and, and multi-stakeholder, not only consultation, but, but active engagement. Um, we don't have much time. I would like to open up uh, in case any of our panelists has any reaction to anything that has been said. The overall question that I would pose, and anyone feel free to, to jump in, uh, is maybe the aspect that we haven't covered so much, which is about international cooperation you know, by countries. Uh, so we focus a lot about what governments can do, but what can governments do collectively on an international level? Uh, of course, this ministerial, it's, it's, uh, it's something that governments can do together, you know, take a stand, come together, share best practices, draw conclusions. But in your view, what, uh, what's the agenda that you would like to see in the next five to ten years, if I might pose these open questions to, to anyone from our panelists who might want to, to, to jump in? Anyone? I'll, I'll have a crack. Yeah. I'll have a crack. Uh, about, at least about a, a specific aspect of the agenda. I mean, obviously, the agenda that has been laid out here is, it can be very, very broad, you know, from uh, setting standards and sharing practices to deal with disinformation and misinformation, I mean, all that stuff. But, you know, from, this, from where I stand, uh, from the standpoint of international idea uh, and the interest of advancing democracy. One thing that hasn't been mentioned that intrigues me a lot is the need to bring digital technologies into the discussion about the future of political representation. Uh, and, and I'll sort of preface this reflection very, very briefly with, a, I guess, a personal anecdote, you know. A, a, well, we know that political parties are in a shambles everywhere, particularly in the eyes of young people. And I myself, you know, I have been participating in meetings about political parties, you know, seminars, congresses, you know, what you name it, for, I don't know, 30 years. And every single one of them ends up with all of us saying, including myself, that we need to strengthen political parties because they are essential for democracy, right? And the fact is that we have nothing to show for it because they are in worse shape than ever in terms of their credibility. So perhaps we are just flogging a dead horse and parties, the way we understand them, might just be a creature of the 20th century. So what I'm trying to get at is that I don't know what will replace political parties, but I have the strong inkling that digital technologies will play and are already playing a big role in the way in the way political representation can work and are playing a big role and will play a big role in enabling a more direct participation in collective decision making for citizens and 
this is really a pending assignment for political science and for political research in general with obvious impact for the future of democracy. So if you ask me, you know, one of the aspects of the agenda going forward that I would like to see is that, you know, if we care about the future of democracy, we should pay close attention to the role of digital technologies in the future of political representation because the current model of political representation is broken. I might just pick up an, another aspect, which is essentially the process of an election itself, which is fundamental to democracy and the ability to change governments. Because ele elections are essentially about the losers and making sure the losers accept the result and trust the process, not the winners. Uh, and I think that's a sort of, uh, the way we can cooperate together as democracies around how we handle elections. Um, there are things such as, um, and we've talked a bit before about sort of cyber issues and, yep. and, and, and some, some, sort of, some forces out there to influence electoral outcomes from outside. So how we can work together on that. In Australia, we have an Electoral Integrity Assurance Task Force, which consists of our intelligence agencies and our Australian Electoral Commission, which works on, 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 on that aspect. And again, how we share information. Um, we also, in Australia, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have also done this, in terms of elections, we have, um, we've, we've got the, the major sort of, uh, the major sort of media, major public uh, digital media companies, even, including TikTok, actually, as well as Google, and all those you'd expect, to take things down. We've got an agreement with them in relation to disinformation around, not about the ideas being fought over in that election, but about the credibility of the election. And uh, for ex I'll give you one, one example, uh, we all uh, be aware that Trump supporters attacked the Dominion voting systems in the most recent elections in Australia. We had uh, um, accusations about uh, these voting systems being in Australia. We don't use them. So we're very quick to move, it, move in shutting that down. And we have a sort of disinformation register. So the more we can sort of cooperate as democracies in relation to techniques at work, um, around the holding of elections to actually shut down debate about the, the quality and credibility of the election itself, not the ideas that are being fought about, but about the institution. Uh, that, that, and I think that's pretty critical. And we're also very vigorous in Australia in, in actually countering disinformation. So our Australian Electoral Commission ran a really strong and vigorous social media campaign to tackle straight away um, uh, what, what, what we saw as information during, during elections. Thank you. What I can add in, in um, what will be the future? So internationally, I think that we need more regulation of, that can drive the process that we're undertaking. It's, it's a need. If we need to be compared, with, if you need to, to see how the democracy is functioning in this country. But then democracy, a part of having very general overview, have a, a country overview. And in the country of review, in my mind, there are two very important things. One is participation in the election, which means that the electoral code in each country needs to be revisited with a digital uh, approach. And, um, and here, we have, um, to, here we have to work. This is also a combined with a lot of uh, digital investment in all countries, because this cannot be done without digital investment. And in the moment that we have a digital voter, we have also to consider that after that, the data that the voters would like to see when the government is doing the job need to be very easy transmitted to them. And the data that for me are very important for the digital voters to be understand are the data that are linked with the public expenditure. So the figures that are in the Treasury statistics are not very easy for a common person to understand what is going on in, in the country. You need to have a more a kind of a civic statistics interpretation for them to make easy and to understand what is going on. So like this, we can have a, a, the, the combination of digital voters with the digital um, Part, digital participation, civic participation. Without that, we cannot see uh, the, the near future. But 
in all this, we have to be very careful because this information is there, is present. So these are not a very easy, um, a very easy action to be undertaken. These need always a, a, a mechanism that will make a, a exchange of view. We'll have a mirror communication. Uh, we have to share with each other what are, what are the effects, what are the obstacles that we have, what, to, what will be the new reality that we are going to create. It's not that easy. So because everything in digitalization is a new area, is completely new. We have not that much experience as in the democracy itself. Digital democracy is a very new thing. So I can conclude that international cooperation is a must for regulation and also for exchange of view and also lesson learned. And then uh, civic participation has two pillars, the voter, digital voters and the digital uh, explanation of the public expenditure. Thank you very much. We have only two minutes left, but uh, being a ministerial and a forum on democracy, as I promised, I wouldn't like to uh, close the session without at least opening up for a cup. I see a couple of comments. Uh, if you can just make them very brief, one minute only, please. Uh, identify yourself, please, very briefly. And, and Sorry. Yes, um, good afternoon. I am Nicole manz Bazawi, and I am with the Secretary of State's Office of Global Women's Issues, working directly for the Secretary of State. Um, thank you very much for your thoughtful and thought-provoking interventions today. Um, a couple of things that I don't necessarily need answers for, but just for all of us to think about as we go forward, um, picking up on some themes that you had. Um, yes, we are definitely moving into the digital world and digital democracy. One thing that keeps me up at night is the digital gender divide and the possibility of further disenfranchising marginalized communities, including women. Second thought on online harassment is a really big problem, not only for those candidates who would run and who are attacked online, but for also the youth, the young women that would consider entering into politics in the future, but see this harassment happening online and it would dissuade them from participating in the process. Um, that also goes along with the idea of a digital signature. I love that for holding people accountable, but I also worry about the possible harassment piece of it. So perhaps a number instead of a name to identify people to protect them and, and their families. Um, the third piece was on um, artificial intelligence. It, this also concerns us because we think of women and girls in STEM and the lack thereof. And so when you think of who is designing artificial intelligence, it's mostly men. And so it's leaving women out of the equation in developing these advanced systems. And then my final uh, point is on data and the collection of data and how important it is to think about what we're measuring and are we measuring just outputs and participation or are we measuring impacts of the policies that we're putting into place and are we doing so with a lens of looking at gender disaggregated data to really identify those uh, potential benefits and inclusion. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Elias Soleil, Ambassador of Costa Rica to the OECD. I want to thank all, all the panel for such uh, valuable information. At this moment, I have a lot of information in my mind getting confused. I feel like a victim of di digitalization, you know. Um, especially, I, I want to be brief. Uh, uh, Kevin and Peter outlined very um, clearly pros and cons of digitalization in public services and how to foster citizen uh, participation, but the cons are concerning me a lot, and maybe um, we might have to look uh, towards a solution that comes uh, from a multilateral approach. Maybe OECD will be the perfect environment for that. But the issue might be uh, cumbersome from a legal and human uh, rights pers perspective. Uh, maybe this question is more uh, addressed to Andrew, but I don't know if you want to share your thoughts about it. How do you think we'll need to, if, no, good to rephrase it. Do you need, we'll maybe need to redefine boundaries of freedom of speech and liberty of press to approach the cons that you were explaining? I would love to hear your thoughts about it. Andy, you wanna go very quickly on that? Um, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Angel. I, 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 I think in the interest of time, that's a topic I'd love to take up with the Ambassador back in Paris. But it, it just quickly, it, there's no short, easy, quick answer. It's something I think we need to collectively look at and begin to look at the 
active experimentation across the OECD countries and beyond to figure out the right balance. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so we were a bit rebel. Actually, we were told to finish at 3.10, so I, I misbehave a little bit, but I thought it deserved, this deserved, and any of the topics we cover could be unpacked and have us for many hours talking about that. I want to thank our speakers and our panelists and also the, all of you for participating. And also a big thank you to the team at the OECD, Carlos and the team at Gov for organizing this session that hopefully will kick off more debate about this. Thank you very much. Thank you.